Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I congratulate you all for the decision of not sitting in the sun and enjoying that extra coffee, but for coming back into the dark with us. Thank you very much for that. Um, we've got 45 minutes or so to, uh, I think, have a really interesting and I hope challenging conversation with Kumi Naidu, who I am delighted to see in this chair. I've seen him in a different chair, the Hard Talk chair, uh, a year or two ago when Kumi first took over Greenpeace International, and one of his first public duties was to be interviewed by me. I think he fired his press team after that. <laughs> Uh, no, actually, it was fascinating hearing what he wanted to do with the organization then, and we can me perhaps measure some of those ambitions against what has happened in, in the intervening period since. Um, just very quickly, ladies and gentlemen, Kumi Naidu, for those of you who don't know him, has uh, an incredible track record of activism. Um, he was a young man brought up in apartheid South Africa, and of course, for him, uh, the struggle against apartheid was perhaps his formative political moment. Uh, he has experienced imprisonment, he's experienced police harassment on a grand scale. For a while, Kumi had to live outside South Africa. He, of course, returned when Nelson Mandela uh, took power. And since then, he's worked in a various, various international organizations, all of them essentially revolving around calls for as he would put it, global justice. He's now refined his uh, activism to Greenpeace, and we'll ask him exactly what that means in terms of how narrow a focus he believes Greenpeace should have. Um, he's been doing the job now for what, a couple of years? Yes. Two years. Um, so as I say, we're gonna test uh, what he's done with the organization. Uh, first thing, uh, yesterday I was waffling on about the importance of democracy. We're gonna emphasize that again today, because if we can, uh, technical team, can we bring up our voting question? We make you do some work at the beginning of these sessions. Uh, here we go with our first piece of uh, crowdsourcing. Has Greenpeace gone soft in its struggle to save the planet? Same rules as before. You, well, uh, <laughs> what a vote of confidence. Oh, no, uh, <laughs> It's the danger of a small, a small sample. There we go. Oh my God, I can't. Talk about a distraction, this is terrible. Um, anyway, everybody, we've got to have your votes. We had fantastic uh, voting record yesterday. We had more than 200 people vote with Jean-Claude Trichet. I'm not sure he was paying any attention to what we decided, but nonetheless. Uh, so far, you can see what's happening here, but if you're going to vote, it's 42SY uh, text for the yes and 42SN for no, or you can go onto the website and the uh, address is there. So keep voting, because it actually is fascinating to watch it unfold. So, without further ado, Kumi, um, I put it to you that there is a widespread perception that Greenpeace has been suckered in to... Uh, cozying up, in a way, to governments and to corporate uh, institutions, trying to influence from the inside rather than keeping that rebel spirit on the outside. How do you plead? Uh, I plead not guilty, <laughs> because uh, it is true that we are spending more time now than we did in the past, engaging directly with the leadership of business and government, but we do that in a way where we continue to be engaged on the outside. So, for example, in Durban, at mm. the last climate negotiations, the big business summit, I was invited together with a few of my colleagues to be on the inside, but there were Greenpeace activists hanging from the building with the same message that I was trying yeah, to do on the inside. How, how, yeah, but how credible is that? You, you know, the old phrase, having your cake and eating it, can you really credibly do both at the same time? Let me just quote to you one guy who thinks that you cannot. Paul Watson, you know him well. I mean, he, he's um, extraordinarily committed to the campaign to stop whaling, in particular, in particular Japanese whaling, and he has his boat, the Sea Shepherd, and he has been in extraordinary scrapes with the Japanese naval forces as he tries to stop um, whaling vessels doing their work in the Pacific. Now, he says of the current state of Greenpeace, he says, you've become an environmental feel-good organization. He says, you've become the equivalent of environmental Avon ladies. And for those of you who know what Avon ladies do, going door-to-door -door selling cosmetics, that's, that's not a good place to be. <laughs> well, let me... This is a very serious question, actually. Mm, it is. Because from where I come from, 
in my entire sort of history of activism, I do not believe in militancy for militancy's sake. I believe that good activism is about having a full menu of toolbox with a range of different tools that you deploy depending on where the context is. Now, when I went to the World Economic Forum for 10 years as a uh, human rights and anti-poverty activist, I could never get a CEO of a company to sit down and talk to me about activists that were in prison in Ethiopia where they were doing business, for example. Mm. I had to, if I had to lobby them, literally I had to follow them into the toilets, right? I, in fact, I lobbied President Clinton to sign the landmine treaty while he and I were doing our business at the men's urinal a couple of years ago. So that, that, that's right? why... Right? That, <laughs> now, when, now, when, now, when, now, we're not living in When I said, <laughs> when I said Kumi Naidu has experienced arrest, now we know why. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway. No, but when I went first time as Greenpeace, I was shocked. Before I even got to Davos, so many CEOs wrote to me wanting to pre-book meetings, right? So... I asked my colleagues, I was very new, I asked my colleagues, this is a new thing for me, they, they were also surprised at how many that mm. year had asked. So I asked one of the CEOs, when I was a bit late getting it to him, and he said, well, Kumi, you need to understand, most of my colleagues in the corporate world are desperate to get Greenpeace at the table because they hope that way they won't be on your menu. Right? Well, but, but many of the corporations that we are talking with, right, we are simultaneously, right? If talking can get the result to secure our children and grandchildren's future, I think Greenpeace and everybody else should do it. But, but However, if talking does not get us yes. far enough, then you have to use conventional resistance to get... Right, movement. because the skeptic in me believes that some of those CEOs, and there may be some in this room, and we're going to get to the audience participation very soon, some CEOs may want the photo opportunity of shaking hands and smiling with Kumi Naidu because they put it in the annual report, they put it in the chapter Corporate Social Responsibility, it makes them feel good, it makes the shareholders feel good, but what actually are these corporates who are talking to you delivering? That's the key question. Now, I think if I look at my last two years, we have won about close to 40 very significant battles against the most powerful corporations on this planet, right? Um, I can quote you getting Nestle to stop buying palm oil from um, newly deforested areas in the Indonesia. Last year, we got Facebook to unfriend coal and not to build its data centers with dependency on coal, and I can give you a long list. So we are winning significant battles and getting uh, companies to move in the right direction, but to be brutally honest with you, I have said it at Greenpeace, and I'll say it outside of Greenpeace, Greenpeace and other environmental organizations are winning many significant battles, but we're losing the war, and we're losing the planet, and we are selling down our children and grandchildren's future. Because the problem we have is there's a, such a problem of serious cognitive dissonance. Now, for those of you who are uh, not familiar with the term from psychology, rather than give you a definition, I'll give you an example. When the Americans were invading and British were invading Britain, Saddam Hussein's information minister was giving a press conference and he was being asked by the journalist, so what do you think about this attack? How long do you think you're going to last? Aren't you concerned? And he said, what attack? I don't know what you're talking about. And behind him you could see buildings burning and, and so on. <laughs> because the attitude, and, I, and, and I'm going to take a cue from my late mother who said to me, better be honest and unpopular than popular and dishonest. I want to say to you, to young people here, Whenever I've heard, since I've been here the last two days, young people get up and say, I'm a leader of tomorrow, mm. I was cringing, cringing. <laughs> I'll tell you why. <laughs> I, I'll, I, I'll tell you why. If young people continue to put the faith in the current generation of adult leadership, whether it's from government, whether it's from business, and I dare say, even whether it's from civil society and NGO, mm -hmm. you are backing a wrong horse because the current generation of leadership is in denial about how serious the problem. But Kumi, you can't just blame it on leaders. Look, I'll just give you a, a raw statistic. In the most recent survey I've seen, 8%, just 8% of the public, not leaders, but the public in the United Kingdom now name environmental concerns as a top priority issue that they want their government to deal with. In the United States, you can look at poll after poll, where not only is the number of people who believe that 
green issues need to be near the top of the political agenda falling, but there's a growing number of people who deny man-made climate change altogether. This isn't about leaders, it's also about public attitudes. You've been at this for a long time, you and others in the environmental movement, and you don't seem to be winning the public side. You know, you're not winning the public argument. Well, Stephen, if I can take the chair from you and be the Art Talk presenter yeah. and ask you a question. Go on. <laughs> Why I, don't, do I don't normally allow this, but go yeah. on. <laughs> Why do you think this is the case? Are you going to blame it on the media? No. Oh. no I, 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 <laughs> If you want to blame it on the media, I think they take a p proportion no, no. of the problem of, of the blame. But well, I'll tell you one reason why I think people are, are showing a trend a away from a concern about uh, environmental issues and certainly putting them at the top of any political agenda, and that is the state of the world economy, in particular in Europe and, and the Western economies. Such an emphasis on austerity. We see joblessness rising. We see ordinary people being squeezed, and I think they fear that when they hear groups like yours associate campaigns to reduce carbon emissions, for example, linked to redefining growth, cutting back on materialism in our societies, they worry that in a time of austerity, that message is simply not suited to where they and their families are at. Okay, and I think that was a very good answer. And Thank that, you. And, and, that <laughs> and that answer for me is a question of leadership. Let me, let me say why. Look at how our leaders are responding to the financial crisis. We live in a moment that can be described as a perfect storm. We've had fuel price, food price, ongoing poverty, climate, and only when the financial crisis hit, our political leaders, particularly in the developed world, who still have most of the power, said, so are we in a crisis? But the fact that every single day on this planet, we lose close to 40,000 human beings, men, women, and children, from preventable causes as a result of poverty-related issues, that's never been a crisis. The fact that the climate science is telling us we're running, we have three years more, 2015, to get emissions to peak and we don't stand a chance if we are to avert catastrophic climate change, we don't have that on the table. WWF is telling us that uh, if we are to deliver the lifestyle that you and I enjoy as a middle-class person in a developing country and as a person from a developed country, if we were to deliver that to all the people on this planet, we'll need five planets. So, rather than respond to each of the crises as, as if they are in standalone uh, silos, right? that's what our governments have been doing. What we need is a different conversation that we get a win for the environment, a win for the economy, a win for job creation, and a win for peace. So, but, but, but I'm not sure anybody believes that it can be win, 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 win all the way around. Well, mean, let me, something has to give, and maybe something has there's to a give lack of honesty in your message because, you know, particularly in a time of, of economic troubles, you steer clear from the idea that in the West we may have to shift our material expectations. Oh, sorry, maybe you didn't hear. I'm very open on this question. Let me be quite blunt about it that one word that should have had more prominence, I think, in this conversation, given that we are talking about risk, is the risks associated with overconsumption, not only in the developed countries of mm. the world, by the way, because actually at the moment, the elites in developing countries, their consumption patterns is also a huge problem. So there is no question, if we are honest, if we are honest about the limitations of what this planet has and how we... We have to have fundamental changes. And business, it's not good enough simply saying we have to do more with less. Because one of the problems, and I'm very sympathetic to this, and maybe this is why people think I'm soft, I'm very sympathetic to the dilemma that business leaders have. There's been an absolute political abdication of responsibility by political leadership to provide the regulatory clarity to give a clear signal to business leaders that we are definitely moving in a... Uh, in, in, in a uh, green economy, low carbon future. Mm. So the other difficulty for business leaders, you have a DNA problem inside you. And that is, in the DNA of business is to do more. More profit, more markets, more product lines, etc. Well, if you sum it up in a word, it's growth. But yes. the danger for you is if you start uh, you know, tackling the, the viability of the growth model, you are seen as anti-growth. And I come back to this point. Right I now, mean, a guy who's peddling an anti-growth message in our, you know, certainly the industrialized economies, ain't going to be popular. 
Yeah, and the struggle for justice is not a popularity contest. I learned this when I was 15, right? And then I'm, I'm, I'm not being facetious. I know that at the end of the day, um, we will have to make some painful decisions about how we actually, as a human family, share this planet in a more equitable way. But we also, and I would say to our leaders in the business community as well, you got to start questioning growth in a fundamental way. And I've been questioning the quality of growth for more than 10 years. Because the growth that most of the powerful in the world have embraced as a wonderful growth since the fall of the Berlin Wall has been growth that has not generated jobs. We have had jobless growth, we've had growth without equity, in fact, to the opposite, the kind of growth that we've had over the last two decades has pushed the gap between rich and poor in virtually every country in the world to us unsustainable levels, and also the gap between most developed and most developing countries, with the ex exceptions of the BRICS countries, the gap has also mm. grown. So that's the kind of conversation that we have. We are in denial about how serious the problem is, but I have no problem of saying that Greenpeace is open and is engaged in a conversation about what do we need to do to challenge the dominant socio-economic paradigm so that we can design a paradigm that actually works for the overwhelming majority of people in the world, rather than the current status quo, which is close to 60 to 70 percent of people are actually marginalized from actually benefiting from the benefits of growth as we might know it. Okay. A couple more thoughts from me, and then we're going to open it up to a, a, a big conversation. Uh, by the way, let's just keep an eye on this. 54% um, now believe that Greenpeace has gone soft, and 46% uh, think, no, you haven't. So if you start shouting or maybe even beating me up, you might be able to switch that around. <laughs> but um, here's a, 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 an important point for you, I think. You are the first, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the first head chief of Greenpeace to come from the developing world, certainly from Africa, am I right? From the developing world. Yeah. So, it seems to me there's a particular issue you, you need to tackle. I, I, I just looked over the past decade at the sorts of pronouncements that have come from Greenpeace, particularly around climate change summits, and Copenhagen comes to mind more than any other. Greenpeace at Copenhagen made it quite plain that it was, it was the failure of the summit was the fault of the rich world. And I, I went back over yeah, some yeah. of the co quotes, you know, it, the, the finger pointing was all at the rich industrialized world, and it was framed in terms of an argument about social justice, and that the, the, the rich West was failing to acknowledge the fundamental social justice argument at the heart of the climate and carbon debate. Now here's the, the, the response to that from a former Greenpeace uh, figure, a, a, a significant figure in the UK, a guy called Mark Linus, who worked with Greenpeace for a while. He left the organization, and one of the complaints he had about the organization was, and this is a quote from him, a complete lack of civil society pressure on China and India. He said, unfortunately, there is an iron rule amongst campaigning groups that you don't blame developing countries. But he said, from now on, given the nature of the global climate and carbon debate, we have to, have to include them when it comes to responsibility and expectation. And he thinks you fail to do so. I fully agree that we have to intensify our pressure on developing countries generally, but particularly the big emerging economies. That is one of the changes I've made in the last two years. We have actually shifted a significant amount of our resources, attention and so on already from 2011 and over the next five years to India, China, Brazil, Indonesia, South Africa, where, you know, I was in the liberation struggle and so on, where I am not very popular these days for the things that right. Greenpeace so, is doing. Well, so we are doing it. Well, but it, it, how do you do it? I mean, how do you oh, go okay. to the South Africans and say to people who, frankly, as you know much better than me, you know, the, the poverty record in South Africa is pretty terrible. T 
terrible joblessness, housing conditions for so many South Africans. How do you go to that country and say, you know, no, we can't rely on coal anymore, we can't rely on coal-fired power, we can't continue with this heavy-emitting mining industry being at the heart of our economy? Because if you say that to South Africa, the people who will be hurt most, arguably, are the poor in South Africa. Well, yes, the tragedy is that even though people in developing countries and particularly poor in the developing world have been least responsible for emissions, they are now already paying the first and the most brutal price in terms of climate impacts. Folks, you need to understand that climate impacts is taking lives now, right? According to the Kofi Annan Foundation, already in 2009, Studies were done to show about 350,000 lives being lost annually. You know, uh, if you don't mind, uh, I know this might make me even sound more soft, but uh, let me start a question that I really love uh, with a sentence. Uh, I strongly support the CIA and the Pentagon when in 2003 they said that the biggest future threat to peace, security, stability and development will not come from terrorism, will not come from uh, conventional conflicts, but will come from the impacts of climate change. And people talk about resource wars happening in the future. What was Darfur? The driver of that conflict was water scarcity and land scarcity, uh, Horn of Africa and the conflict. So bottom line is, the poor are already being punished by impacts on climate change. The Coal plants that are being proposed by the government of South Africa is not intended, as far as I'm concerned, to take the one in five rural South African outside of energy poverty. Because if we are serious about actually bringing the 1,6 billion people that mm. are completely energy poor, do not have access to a single light bulb, the way we're going to do it is not through big nuclear power plants and big uh, coal plants. It is through decentralized micro-renewable energy provision. And if we, it's the safest, it, it's the uh, quickest we can do it. And on the long term, will also be the uh, cheapest to do it. So I would argue that the struggle to end global poverty and the struggle to avert catastrophic climate change can and must be seen as two sides of the same coin. And to put it in permanent opposition to each other. And by the way, just to be clear, I've just been in the Amazon. We're working with trade unions, with indigenous peoples, with landless peoples movements and so on. And they completely get it. They get that keeping the Amazon standing as more value for them in a long-term basis than actually destroying it. Because if you ask yourself who benefits at the moment, right? it's the elites in developing countries, a handful of elites, as well as their partners in the developed world. Africa, I always say, you know, is one of the richest continents underneath the ground. You name it, we have it. And precisely because of that, we are one of the poorest continents above the ground. Mm. What in the, jarg in the literary jargon is called the resource curse. But the, 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 the danger I see, Kumi, it, it gets to the question, the implication behind the question as well, is that the more you broaden the scope of Greenpeace and you talk with such passion about social justice, the campaign against global poverty, being interwoven into your messages about, about the environment, climate change and carbon in the world, the more grand your horizon and the scope of what you want to do, the less immediate and direct impact you have on any piece of that particular jigsaw. I think, Stephen, that's a criticism obviously I've heard before. Also, you ate within Greenpeace, by the way. Yeah? Uh, Is there an internal discussion yeah, about Look, how broad you really should yeah, yeah. paint your campaigns? Yeah. But, you know, let me put it in a, in, a, in a light anecdote. When I was appointed at um, Greenpeace, President Obama appointed a friend of mine called Van Jones as his green job czar, he was called. I don't know why he was called a czar, but anyway. These days, everybody's a czar. Yeah. Have you got any sort of responsibility <laughs> at all, you're a czar. But, yeah. So there was a profile done in several newspapers in Europe and him because he has a similar background, human rights, anti-poverty uh, sort of background. Mm. And then w while doing that work, we began to understand that actually environmental destruction hurts the poor, destroys the poor's ability in uh, future and so on. And both of us made the transition to environmentalism at the same time. Do you know what that article was entitled? 
why it is so difficult. The whole article was entitled, Why it is so difficult to be green and black at the same time. He's an African-American, right? I think that question is a very old school way of thinking. We have to understand that humanity does not exist in, you know, we as human beings don't have like compartments in us, which is health, education, you know, employment and so on. We are holistic beings. We have to address, understand what the women's movement said to us about five decades ago. Uh, and, I, and maybe if you don't mind, organizers, I want to say, I think next year you can do better on having <laughs> right. more gender balance on your main we, panel. You're not you the mind. first to make that point. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, that point. That point has been well made and I hope well received. So, uh, yeah, but get, get back to your thought on that. What, what's this link? What's this link you see between lessons the women's movement has taught? Yeah, and the, the women's movement gave us, I have to confess, a rather cumbersome word, but a very powerful word decades ago called intersectionality. And that That's is, a terrible word. Yeah, it is a terrible word, I agree. But the concept behind that is they said if we were going to advance a world of gender equality, we needed to understand how gender intersects with race, class, age, ability, religion, and so on. And today, the only way we are going to get out of the crisis that we're in, and, and I would argue, we have next month Greenpeace will be launching its updated energy revolution scenario. Mm. In it, the argument gets stronger and stronger, backed by very senior people in business as well, that the job creation potential of moving to a green economy future is significantly more than clinging onto a fossil fuel based uh, 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 economic future. And I'll tell you, in our conversation with Angela right. Merkel uh, last year in the middle of the nuclear phase out fight, one of the arguments that actually played very well into it, we put the figures on the table and we said, Chancellor, the nuclear industry is generating 30,000 jobs after decades of taxpayer-funded subsidies in the billions of euros. The wind industry, right, much, much younger with a fraction mm. of the subsidies, is already generating close to 300,000 jobs. If that investment is good for employment, good for the uh, economy, good for the uh, social justice side, and it's good for the environment and the climate, why would you not want to move in that direction. And I have to say, in these conversations which we have once a year, there wasn't a positive forthcoming answer, and the body language was, actually, you, you guys got a point. And we're going to continue to press the employment potential, and that's where I talk well, about the win-win. Yeah, right? well, I, I, I'm always sceptical of win-wins, because I always feel there's a loser out there somewhere. But, um, <laughs> but, but you just brought me to one last big theme I want to address, and then I am going to open it up, I promise. Uh, you've just mentioned green technology, and always, you know, advocates like you talk about the incredible potential of green technology. Why is it that so many other forms of technology, which may well help to save our planet, you are so utterly negative about? I'm thinking about, for example, carbon capture and storage, which could allow fossil fuels, carbon-based energy, to find a new lease of life, because we can deal with the emissions that go with those energy sources. Why are you so negative about genetically modified organisms, uh, plants which might be able to thrive in much tougher conditions, more drought-based conditions? Why, ultimately, are you so negative about nuclear power when a lot of people, again, even some ex-members of your own organization, have now concluded that to have a viable response to climate change, nuclear has to be part of the mix. Why are you technophobe except for green energy solutions? Ah, well, firstly, that's not factually accurate in the sense that we, on, say, agriculture, on sustainable agriculture, we are completely open to looking at new innovations in technology. But you have technology. activists but operating no, 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 but in your name who go and plow up fields of yes, test because crops for GM foods. Well, if we play back your, your three sets of questions to me, right? Mm. The word might appeared at least twice, right? So let me, I, I can't deal with each one because of yeah, time, but right? But let's just take carbon capture and storage. Why we are opposed to carbon capture and storage? Because the most optimistic thinkers and the technological experts say that if after massive amounts of investment, this technology will work to scale, right? There's no guarantee that it can work to scale. 
right, at the moment. But we are being asked to put billions and billions of dollars in a technology that has not been tried and tested. And if it is successful, the best optimistic thought is that only by 2030, that technology will actually be able to actually, uh, you know, give us some real impact. How can we back on something that will cost us billions and billions and billions, trillions of dollars in the end, that might not work at the end of it, and then it becomes an excuse, like a false hope, because people think, okay, carbon capture and storage is coming, so we wait for it, and then we come to 2030, and in fact, the technology doesn't actually work. Well, there, so, there, there are people in but the on industry GMO, who... Sorry, who, I, I must say something about uh, the GMO thing, if you don't mind, quickly. For, it needs a longer conversation. I've been quite concerned, and the young people I met with at lunch shared my concern about how, in fact, there is a very unscientific understanding of not what Greenpeace says, but what the leading authorities in agriculture say. There's an annual international agricultural assessment that is done, which even has the World Bank and other organizations part of it. And bottom line is the claims made by the GMO industry has been largely false. It has offered, uh, you know, for example, drought-resistant seeds. Mm. You said there might be, right? Mm. You say it 25 times, then people start believing that such a thing actually exists. You know, you say it on BBC, CNN, and a few other things, something that actually has not been tried and tested, doesn't have a track record, and so well, on. And, we, we, we know GM yeah. uh, crops are already being grown, and we know that yields can be improved, that, that uh, uh, disease resistance can be improved, because it's already happening in the field. So, I mean, uh, you're swimming against the tide of science there. Well, I'll tell you, you're looking at a certain part of the world, right? Yes. The, the full story on GM foods is much more complicated. You know, the story for me that, uh, that touches my heart is the fact that in many parts of the developing world, Africa and, and Asia, if you can take... Africa, most of the farmers, right? Most of our food protection historically has been produced by African women farmers who are small-scale farmers. They are being pushed out by the, the GMO sort of machine, or at the threat of being pushed out. And if you go to a place like... In, and, and with promises that have not delivered for people on our continent yet. In India, if you go and look at the suicide rates of Indian farmers as a yeah. result... Of, so you're giving one side well, of the story... I, yeah, the, the I, other I just, side. I'm just trying to get inside a mindset, that's all. And this yeah. is my last point. I mean, the danger is you, you, you appear to have prejudged some of the technological solutions might be out there. The final one that I just want a brief comment from you on, and then we'll go to the, everybody else, is, is, is the nuclear issue. Because, you know, again, you can find uh, Mark Linus, I've quoted him already. I mean, he's now saying, you know, Greenpeace has made a terrible mistake. We, we cannot reject nuclear as part of a mix. It's not the entire solution. It's not the silver bullet, but it has to be part of a, an energy mix. And James Lovelock, one of the most respected writers on the future of our planet, he long ago reached the same conclusion. Are you prepared, as we see, you know, the energy question become ever more pressing across this planet, are you prepared to reassess Greenpeace's absolute rejection of nuclear energy? We will be prepared to reassess anything that comes with new, fresh knowledge and evidence which goes against us, the reality of nuclear, which is that it is too expensive, it is too dangerous, and as a solution to climate change, will deliver too little, too late. Now, assuming the nuclear industry was here and looked us in the eye and said, folks, I want to tell you something. We have found a solution where safety has been taken care of. We can guarantee you that no terrorist will ever attack any nuclear facility anywhere in the world in the future, that no human being working in any of these plants will ever make an error, and thirdly, there will be no technological problems, and let's say we all say, that's great, wonderful, that's great. The problem which the nuclear industry, and I must say sadly, a lot of those in, who are in very powerful public commentary positions are not addressing, and that is the issue of nuclear waste. What happens to the waste at the end of the cycle? In the interest of time, let me just give you an image rather than go into it. Yeah. Today, archaeologists, when they go and excavate and they find artifacts, buildings, other treasures that our ancestors left for us. Because nuclear waste takes several hundred years to become safe again, 
the archaeologists of the future, the, our children and grandchildren that choose to do that, will, if the water supplies have not been completely, uh, water tables have not been uh, contaminated, they will find the most toxic, most poisonous, most dangerous substances that we would have left for them. Unless you can solve the issue well, about toxic, uh, sorry, nuclear waste, we do not believe. And, and also, when we have not maximized, mm. see, if you were sitting here and telling me, Stephen, that, Kumi, every renewable energy source has been maximized. We have done that, and then we still have a gap, and let's look at all the dangerous technologies and then look at which ones we choose. I think that's a different conversation. It is hard to ask humanity not to, uh, to move in that direction when we have not harnessed the renewable, safer well, options that we have. I find that answer fascinating, because it seems to me, I'm, I'm just thinking as you speak about the grand theme of, of the two days here at St. Gallen, which is facing risk, and you've just placed the risks all frankly on one side of the equation which is you know that's what campaigning groups do i understand i mean you could redefine the the nature of the risk argument very differently in in nuclear you know the risks of not keeping a nuclear option open for for um the world's economy nonetheless a uh, very clear case made and in fact the passion of your case has convinced now a majority that greenpeace hasn't gone soft so congratulations for that it, it, it it may be time, actually. Let's say you've, you've gone over the threshold there of 50%, so congratulations for that. Why don't we big, bring up the second question so people can wrestle with that one while we, we now make this highly interactive and get people's questions and thoughts for Kumi. Uh, the second question, if we can bring it up, is um, Greenpeace should target governments and consumers. The, the main focus of your campaigning work should be governments and consumers, not corporates, because you began by saying how you're trying to work much more with the corporate sector. We haven't brought that up yet, but we'll bring it up in a minute. And when we bring it up, start voting again, because it'll be interesting to see what uh, everybody thinks on that. Here we go. Um, Greenpeace should, should target governments and the public, frankly, uh, rather than corporates, because we can't ever trust corporates to really heed the message or to deal with it in a, in a you know, straightforward fashion. Let's see what you think about that. But ladies and gentlemen, I found what Kumi's been saying absolutely fascinating. Hands raised, please, if you'd like to uh, question or comment. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm almost inclined to say no, because I couldn't see your hand, but I'm going to say yes, because you're cheeky, and I like it. So go on. <laughs> uh, uh, hi, uh, my name is Karthik. I'm from India. Uh, in my essay uh, that I wrote for Singhalan, uh, I, I was a, it was a pro-nuclear essay which basically argued along the very same lines that you did, uh, Kumi, about getting all these people out of poverty. And it is an accepted fact that nearly 400 million people in India live without electricity access even today, you know, while the claims may be different. And it is definitely true that nuclear is definitely the only way going forward that a country like India can scale up capacity addition at the rate that is needed. Uh, just to counter the facts that you just came up with in terms of uh, uh, the safety, right? You do know of things called passive safety systems which do not rely on human intervention, right? Gravity-based flows, convection-based flows, which do not rely on... The same thing that happened in Fukushima cannot happen again because there is technology that's available today, right? It's not 40 years old, it's up and coming, right? You have small breeder reactors which are 45 megawatt in size which can be installed in corners. It yeah, doesn't we don't, have we don't to be know I, I, I think it's a really good question. Right? Um, I'm going to try and cut it a right. little bit so short. What I'm, saying is that, what I'm saying is that yeah. you do have to, I think, be abreast with the technological developments before you go on a, on a sort of heartfelt uh, yeah. rant about the fact that nuclear energy is right. bad for Well, a very powerful question, if I may say so. So deal with it, Kumi. You want to collect this? Do one one to one? Oh, sorry? You don't know, take each one at a time? Yeah, yeah, for the moment. We might take a bunch later, but that's such a good one. You've got to answer it. Yeah, yeah. So, so listen, I congratulate you on your essay uh, <laughs> that got you to this place. Uh, but, you know, when you get back to India, I think it's important to understand that the people that will resist this are resisting for a range of different reasons. If you go to Tamil Nadu and the struggles of the villages in Kodakolam at the moment, okay. you're from there, okay. Right. So you know that actually Greenpeace is a marginal factor in that. It's a very grassroots, uh, you know. But the, the issue is, and, and you saw it with Fukushima, that I do not believe claims like as solid as you made it. It's true, the first part of what you said is true. Even on coal, 
even on nuclear, we can do it more safely or more better than we perhaps did it 40 years ago. I accept that fact. The question is, does it get us far enough in terms of where we need to be in terms of securing a safe energy supply for the future? But the other issue that, you know, in South Africa at the moment, uh, my country, our government is talking about making a trillion dollar investment in nuclear as well. What's very interesting, when you go and look at where they are thinking about siting it, where they are thinking about storing the nuclear waste at the end of the cycle, and where the energy generated will mm. actually be deployed, right? When you look at those questions, the answers are troubling, and I suspect no different in India, that the beneficiaries will mainly be the interests of big industries. That's the reality in South Africa right now. Industry pays less than what the consumer, mm. households pay and so on. So it's a longer conversation. I'm happy to talk to you a little bit uh, after this. But, uh, but I think that, you know, on all of these things, facts, you know, every time Stephen, for example, says, Mike Linus, this ex-person and that ex-person of Greenpeace, I think, you know, I could go find... Yeah, well, you know, you're not going to be allowed to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've just looked at my wife, I can't believe how time is flying. So I'm going to take three at once, and the rule yeah. is, you've got to be brief, okay. and you've got to be brief, all of you, with comments or questions. So, uh, in no particular order, lady at the front, if we can get... Uh, I don't know where the mics are yet. Good, you're running, that's excellent. So, lady at the front, and then we'll take... The gentleman near the camera at the back. Yes, hi, my name is Emily. I'm a bit shy now to call myself a, a leader of tomorrow with what you said. So let's, let's say... No, no, you are, should say I'm no, a leader of today. But I was going to say I am a puzzle solver of tomorrow, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> so what I wanted to say is that we, we are in a fight, David, against Goliath when it comes to corporation environment. And uh, it, it's a bit discouraging to take a look at the future and you have so much energy when you fight for your cause. What would you say to, to us young people to give us the courage to keep fighting and not give up our values, uh, to, to, to keep on and, and follow our values all along our yeah. life? Well, very good question. and I'm looking forward to a brief answer on that, but I'm going to take a couple more. Uh, the gentleman at the back behind the TV camera who's waving very happily and he's got his thumb up. There he is. Oh, well, actually, you can be next then, sir. You've got the microphone, so yeah. you first, and then the gentleman behind you. Hi, I'm from Australia. I'm a late puzzle solver of tomorrow. And my question is about the image of Greenpeace. Mm. I've got a friend who's in the activist movement in Australia, and he introduced the concept of inessential weirdness. Now, I want to ask a question about Greenpeace's image when it comes to engaging with corporates and whether wearing a suit could help when you're meeting with CEOs and whether that might hold, hold Greenpeace back. It, it, it seems like a bit of a rough question. I, I really like the shirt, by the way. But I want, <laughs> <laughs> but I want to ask you... you there. I'm going to stop you there. I like the question, but I've got it, so don't worry. Uh, next, one more. Yeah, the, the, yeah, it's you. Go on. Hello, um, thank you. I'm, I'm Mark from France. I'm an LOT, I guess. Um, <clears throat> anyways, so my question relates to um, what you were saying earlier about being against growth and how that's very unpopular. Mm. What do you think the role of degrowth, uh, like s soft movements, soft power movements, which try to emphasize an alternative to growth in the ultimate um, fight against climate change, etc.? Okay. Well, let, let's go through them quickly, one by one. Okay. Uh, how, how can young people okay. best keep up the fight? Okay. Firstly, I think we have to recognize the struggle for social, economic, environmental, climate justice, gender justice, whatever. These struggles are marathons and not a sprints. So the biggest sense of approach one needs to have is that these are long fights and we need to be thinking with a sense of perseverance, courage, and so on to ensure that, you know, people feel a sense of being inspired. But also, I think we should not underestimate the value of um, small but significant wins, because people need to see that their activism or their participation is delivering results and are moving in a positive direction. And, that, and then uh, on the issue of keeping people's sort of motivation. I think the most important thing that young people must do now is resist the idea that they are half empty. They should say, actually, we are half full. We are leaders of today. We have fresh ideas. And in fact, you 
folks who are in adult leaders are the biggest bunch of losers around. We, are, we refuse to continue to vest our faith in y'all because y'all simply are often trying to rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic while it's sinking. All right. Y'all are trying to protect the system yeah, right. when it needs to be redesigning the system. All right, we've got to be really brief okay. now. Oh, sorry. The, the, the next one, if I can paraphrase Image. it, is can green activists and green movement leaders such as yourself stop being a bit weird? Be a bit more mainstream and, and, and maybe put on a business suit and tie now and again. Well, if you're an African, this for me is my business suit. Yeah. Well, that's, and I make that's no apologies point. for it. That, I think, I think we'll, leave, we'll leave that answer there because I think that is the perfect answer to that one. So I, I don't have any... <laughs> Don't have any problem with that at all. You know, the final one, I, I think we've sort of gone over it, to be honest. It was a, another question about you know, the dangers of being anti-growth and how you couch that argument in a way that actually appeals to people rather than scares them off. I think we need an honest conversation about growth. And if it scares people, then let us be scared. Right? Let us, uh, if in fact, a growth model that we've had that has only benefited one proportion of the planet's population, that people seem to defend it at all costs, those that have benefited from it, and if it has not worked, let's be honest, it hasn't worked, let's open up our imagination, and if there's elements I don't fully understand, to be honest, all the details of people who advance the degrowth idea, but we have to question the quality of growth, and if it does actually mean that we begin to look at new notions of how humanity should benefit itself, such as uh, the Bhutan's gross national happiness. People mm. might laugh at it, but go look at it. It brings a different frame of how we can think about what constitutes prosperity right. uh, on this planet. Gotcha. Right, two more really quick, and then we're going to be kicked off the stage. So you, sir, over there, if we can get your microphone. We've got to be really quick, though, or else I'll be in big trouble. Uh, Ms. Salvador Rihilme from Free University of Berlin. Um, congratulations for advocating an environmentally sustainable growth paradigm in the developing world. But my question is, does Greenpeace also push the, does it also push the West in terms of sharing its financial resources and technical expertise in environmentally sustainable technology in the developing world? Right, okay, good one. And one more, if there is one. Uh, there's one over there. And you're going to be the last one, I'm afraid. Yep. Hi, thank you very much. I'm Jona from Amsterdam, and I heard you talk two times about, about jobs, that green energy will take more jobs to produce the same, and it's terrible that small farmers are kicked out of African lands by more efficient farming. And to me, it sounds a little bit Luddite. It's to me, progress to a large extent doing more with less, so producing more with less labor hours, and how then the rest is a problem of dividing the wealth. It is the, an, an interesting problem, but it seems to me that you like more work, and I actually don't like work, so I want to see how you think about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, right, you got... First answer is very easy. Seconds, yeah. First answer is, does Greenpeace put pressure and encourage developed countries mm. to share the technology? Absolutely, yes. It's a big fight. It's part of the climate negotiations. And to be honest, there's a lot of short-sightedness on the part of several countries that hold patents and companies that hold patents not to want to share the technology. When our children and grandchildren's futures is at stake, I think we need much more openness in terms of sharing because at the end of the world, we are, uh, end of the day, we either get this right as a united human family of rich and poor countries acting together so we secure the future of all our children because ultimately if we get this wrong and if the climate science is right, which many of us believe it is, then we're actually destroying our children's future. And on the Luddite mm. issue, Yes, I do like working hard, but I, but I think when what we are fighting for as so much of um, the stakes are so high, I think all of us need to actually do that. But you're, it's not about just simply praising small and criticizing big. If big can actually give things that actually add value in a way that's sustainable, that's non-destructive, absolutely, let's embrace it. But the problem is often that which is done with big infrastructure projects, there's a handful of people that get rich out of it, but the people that it, who it was intended for often are actually marginalized and do not benefit. All right, Kumi, thank you for being so uh, concise at the end there. Just before we finish, late breaking news from the voting booth. 
yes, people in the audience believe that Greenpeace shouldn't waste too much time focusing your efforts on, on the corporates. They want you to focus on political leaders and publics first and foremost. So that's quite an interesting conclusion Good there. news, we're doing all three <laughs> at the um, moment. And, and uh, there's another session about to begin, ladies and gentlemen. We've slightly overrun on time, but I think that is true to say it's only because Kumi Naidu is a guy who is really fascinating, compelling listening. So I want you all to thank him very much for giving his time today. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.